In the name of the one true God, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, who created us, who redeemed us, and who has sanctified us to be his own. My dear friends, the portion of God's word to which I direct your attention for comfort and strength in times of worry and fear is taken from Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, and I'll read again for you the final two verses of that lesson. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. In the name of Jesus, our peace. What I'm about to share with you is a true story. It was Thanksgiving Day. A home was filled with extended family. There were aunts and uncles and cousins by the dozen. And they had gathered around the table in order to celebrate God's rich blessings on them for another year, to praise him and to enjoy them. And so, after the table prayer was prayed, and the food was passed, plates were filled with things like turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy and three kinds of vegetables and sweet potatoes and pumpkin pie. The room was filled with chatter as everyone began to eat. And after about 10 minutes into the meal, one of the little five-year-olds sitting at the table just burst out and said, pass the potatoes. And immediately his mother was on him and said, how dare you be so rude and impolite? Apologize to everybody here. And he did. But it just so happened that they were audio recording the meal. And later on that day, when they played back the recording, to the embarrassment of the adults, they heard this little five-year-old politely ask for someone to pass, it, to pass him the potatoes, not once, not twice, but three times. And finally, the fourth time, he burst out, pass the potatoes. So can you imagine how this five-year-old felt on that Thanksgiving day? No one was paying any attention to him when he asked politely for the potatoes. And finally, when he did what was necessary to get somebody's attention, he got the scolding of his life, and he had to apologize. Do you think he felt like he mattered? That people noticed him? I would imagine he felt very insignificant on that day. And perhaps you can relate to that child. Perhaps you've been praying humbly to your Father in heaven day after day, week after week, maybe even month after month, for some relief from your chronic pain. That the Lord would give you some respite from the verbal or physical abuse of a loved one that you continue to endure, or that your ongoing struggles with just controlling your emotions. And after offering up those prayers time after time, you don't see any change. Nothing seems to improve. And you reach the point where you're ready to look up into the skies and say, well, somebody listen to me and hear me. And you feel like that five-year-old at the Thanksgiving table. As though nobody's listening, nobody cares. That the one who is on high in heaven above, who has the power to do something for you, really isn't paying any attention to you. It's when we are faced with that kind of feeling 
when we are faced with worry that flows from that, because if God is not going to step in to handle our big issues, then can we really trust him to handle all the other little ones too, like food and clothing? Do we really matter to God? And so to help us answer that question for ourselves and to give us encouragement and strength, Jesus spoke the words of our lesson from Matthew chapter 6, beginning with verse 35. And what is the first thing that Jesus does? He points us to the birds of the air and the plants, the flowers that grow in the field. He starts with the birds and he says, look at them. They have not been given the ability to store up seeds or insects in barns so that they have food for the future. No, they are very dependent daily on God to give them what they need to survive day by day. And they're still with us. And from there, he points to the flowers of the field, to the plants. You know what? They're even more needy and dependent than birds, aren't they? You know, at least birds can run or fly around and range over great distances to find food for themselves. But a plant, that, that's stuck right where it lands and grows, right? Everything has to come to it. And yet, the Lord sends rain and sunshine at the proper time in the right proportions for them to remain alive. Look around you. Look at all the grass and the plants. They still exist together with the birds. So what does that tell you about God's attitude toward plants and animals? Well, they matter to him as part of his creation, don't they? And so based on that, Jesus asks this all-important question, are you not much more valuable than they? Now, what's the implied answer? Yes, you are much more valuable than they are. But then you and I look at our present circumstances, the fact that, you know, our, our chronic pain, our lack of respite from the abuse that others are dishing out to us, uh, the ongoing internal emotional struggles that we may have just don't seem to go away. And we say, well, I really don't feel like I'm more valuable than birds and flowers. And so what else can we look to as evidence that we really matter to God that we matter more to him than birds and grass. Well, let's go to the very beginning. Back to creation itself. Remember what the Lord said? He said, let us make mankind in our image. He created us for a unique relationship with himself. The birds, the cats, and the dogs the maple trees outside, they don't know God. They don't understand God. They don't love him. They don't trust him. They don't have that capability. God created you and me for that. He gave us that capability of having a relationship with him. That sets you apart. You're more valuable than birds and grass. Then on top of that, God made mankind ruler over all of his creation. He gave us dominion over it all. So again, once more, he's saying, you're more valuable than the plants and animals for which God cares daily. And when you look at the plants, some of the flowers that are out there are dressed more gloriously than Solomon was in all his splendor. And so Jesus says, if God cares for those insignificant plants, so he will care for you. But there's one difference between plants and animals that may again lead us back into doubt 
about God's care. There's one thing you're capable of and I'm capable of that plants and animals are not. And that's sin against God. Your cat can't rebel against God. You have and I have. The animals and the plants don't deserve to burn in hell, but you do and I do. Why? Because we have bitten the hand that feeds us and the hand that clothes us over and over again. We do that every time we boast about and take glory for the gifts and abilities that God has given to us. Look what I did. And then in turn, look down on others because they perhaps haven't been given that same gift. Or on the flip side, maybe you're envious of the gifts God has given to others. And you're bitter and angry at God. Cheated me. And that's based on the false belief that somehow God owes us something. And the truth is, God owes us nothing. We're the ones who owe him everything. But whenever we treat him as our debtor, as someone who owes us something, we disgrace him. And for those sins and countless others, you and I deserve to be cast into the flames. And so with that on our record, does God care for us? Is he abandoning you? Is he abandoning me in our time of trouble, in our time of need because of our past? Is he saying, I don't hear you? And I'm not paying attention to you? Well, once again, let's look to the word of the Lord in the scriptures. What did God do from eternity as we read in our Ephesians lesson? He chose you. God saw the corruption that would exist in you, that would fill your entire nature. And instead of choosing to turn the dial of his love for you to the off position, God chose to turn it to the high position and to send his own son into this world to give him the love that he expects from you and me. And then to go to the cross and have his love switched off on him instead of switching it off on you and me. Do you think you matter? If God sent his own son for you? And then on top of that, when we were his enemies, when we hated God and wanted nothing to do with him, God sent his spirit into our hearts through the power of his word and through the washing of baptism. He renewed us. He gave us rebirth. So that now we love him, we trust him, and we're able, even though it's imperfect, to bear fruit for him. It's all his working in us. And then he calls us to be his witnesses, to go forth in his name. Do you think you matter to God? Yes, you do matter. And so when you are going through those occasions in life where there is no let up of the chronic pain, no respite from the troubles and the strains, know that that is not coming on you, that is not being taken away because God doesn't care. All those other things we talked about, looking at the flowers of the field, the birds of the air, what Christ what came to do for you, and what the Spirit has worked in you, is evidence that he does care. But God has a special plan for you through what you are enduring and suffering. So that you can honor and glorify his name that you can let the world see the change that the Lord has made in your heart and let the world see the confidence you have in his love.
Here we are told at the end of our lesson by Jesus, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Why does God let you, let you endure all these other physical troubles and sometimes emotional troubles in life? So that you can let the world see what is most important to you, not the things of this world. It's your relationship with God that matters above all else. And if you have peace with God, you are set for eternity. Seek first his kingdom. And that means our first concern is to feed our souls with the word of God, and then from there to think about feeding our bodies, right? Our first concern is to be dressed in the righteousness of Jesus through faith and Jesus' work for us. Because his robe of righteousness makes us stylish in the Father's eyes. Then after that, be concerned about being stylish in the eyes of the people with whom you live and work. And so God has put you where you are in the situation that you are in so that you are able to demonstrate such faith and trust in him and not to give way to worry. As Jesus said, worry cannot add one hour to your life. Worry won't put food on the table. Worry won't put clothes on your back. But the one to whom you matter, the one who created you, the one who laid down his life for you and took it back again, the one who lives in you through faith, the Holy Spirit of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit care for you deeply. You matter to them. And it is for that reason that you are able to be patient in love, to endure hardship, and to forgive in an unlimited way. Because God has been all these things to you first. And so confident in the truth that you matter to God, go and live your lives boldly to his glory, knowing that in the end you will be with him in glory forever. Amen. Please stand.